the Lord. So glad you're here with us this morning. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Trust you had a good night's rest. Amen. And uh, we are excited about what the Lord is going to do here for us today. Uh, we've got a couple of prayer requests. Brother Joel Sneed was scheduled to be here with us. And yesterday I got a text message from him and then called and talked to him. And uh, his son, uh, Tucker, Tucker is uh, about 18, 19 years of age, has had a chronic heart uh, disease uh, all of his life, but they went back to the hospital just for a checkup, and they have taken him to New Orleans, possibly for a surgery and some things that are very critical. And so I told him we would be praying for them, that the Lord would touch uh, Tucker and minister to their family, and as well, uh, Sister Lacey that was sitting here last night, they passed her and her husband uh, good ways away. They was driving back last night, and another, the other couple of young ladies was here on the front between an 18-wheeler and a uh, concrete uh, barrier, and it was a tire laying in the road and they had no alternative but to run clean over it, totaled their car. They was, they was uh, spared and safe and rejoicing because some of them was filled with the Holy Ghost last night. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I couldn't tell if it was a victory report or what it was when they a text message because they were so excited because they'd got filled with the Holy Ghost. The last thing she said is she said, I'd have drove a thousand miles and do it all over again just to be under the anointing. Praise God. Stand with me right now. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. So glad that you're here. This is kind of what's going to happen this morning. Sister Amy is going to come lead us in a chorus and then Pastor Tim is going to come. Two assistant pastors are going to speak to us this morning. I believe it's important that it, as an older generation, we give a place at the table for younger men that are coming on. Brother Noah, I put you in the younger men class. Hallelujah. I believe it's important that, and I'm so thankful years ago that somebody gave me an opportunity, Brother Scott, to uh, get involved and put my hands in the ministry. And uh, so we're believing the Lord just to help us today. And I know that God is going to do that. Uh, we, uh, uh, let, me, let me just admonish you, uh, all of you senior pastors, ministers, because uh, I had several that, that pulled their card out and then they talked to somebody else and didn't realize there was more in that card. So if you just threw the envelope away and all you got was the card, you missed a blessing. Praise God. So uh, uh, I can tell some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. So you might want to look in that envelope. Praise God. We, uh, we're going to believe the Lord. Let's pray. Let's pray and believe the Lord to help us this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace, the privilege that we have to be in your house this morning. I thank you, Lord, for men and women that are anticipating and hungering, Lord, after your divine spirit. Your divine enablements, Lord, minister, move in this house, strengthen and encourage. Lift up the hands of your people. Lord, I pray that you would quicken us in heart and mind. May the sweet Holy Ghost resonate in this house, touching your people, Lord. We need you, Lord, in these last days. We're calling upon you and believing you. Touch, touch the Sneed family this morning, Lord. I pray you would come down and touch Tucker, Lord. Heal that heart for the glory of God as a testimony of your faithfulness. Minister, oh God. Minister, oh God, for your glory. Lift your hands and praise him for what he's going to do this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I bless you.
good to you. Express your thanks to him right now. God, we love you. We worship you. We thank you. God, you've been so good to us, Lord. We worship you. We thank you for your faithfulness. Oh, you've been so faithful to us, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Can we do that? Lord, we thank you. God, we praise you. Exalt your name. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Oh, you're worthy. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Turn, shake somebody's hand. Tell them good morning as we get ready to enter into the word of God today. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you. My, my, what a wonderful time we had in the Lord last night. And uh, thankful for what God is doing in the house of the Lord. Thank you for being here, believing the Lord to help us this morning. Real quickly, before I, I preach, I want to make you aware and let you know of, uh, maybe you saw some things out there in the foyer, but uh, most of that stuff out there, uh, actually uh, all of it, is free resources. There's a lot of free resources out there, uh, children's ministry resources, uh, teaching content. There's a lot of stuff out there. We wanted, as we were talking and praying about this conference, this meeting, we wanted to be a place where you would come and feel the presence of the Lord and, and have uh, you know, God minister in your uh, life uh, at an altar and God would move. But also that you would leave uh, with uh, resources, with content that you could take back to your church and use it in your local context. So, so there's a lot of free stuff out there. Check that out. Also, uh, courtesy of uh, Pastor Jared Davis, there is uh, a free book for every minister out there in the foyer. Uh, it's a counseling book that will help... Uh, it has a service or scriptures uh, for very different uh, counseling skills and things that would be an aid for you. So that's out there free. And then also I, I want to give every minister here a copy of the book that I wrote on speaking in tongues. And so if you're here and you don't already have that, I want to give that, put that in your hands as a resource for you. How many are thankful for what God did last night? Oh, yes, I'm thankful for what God did last night. Now, this morning, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to uh, teach, preach, uh, expound on what God, I believe God has laid upon my heart. And uh, my job this morning is to set the ball on the tee so that Brother Noah can <laughs> knock it out. So that's my job this morning. Uh, and so I believe in the Lord to help us this morning. I want to preach to us this morning. On the 22nd century Pentecostal, I want to preach to us this morning, teach to us this morning about the 22nd century Pentecostal. Acts chapter 2, verse 39, the Bible says, For the promise is unto you and unto your children, and to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself. From this untoward generation. Save yourself from this untoward generation. The defining mark of the first church was that it was a Pentecostal church. The church was birthed at uh, in the day of Pentecost, we have the church being exalted and, and taken to where God would have it to be. And the first century church was Pentecostal because they operated in the gifts of the Spirit and proclaimed the necessity of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first century church was a Pentecostal church because of what they experienced in the upper room, because of what God did in the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And the first century church church was Pentecostal, not because they had Pentecostal heritage, but because they had an experience with the Spirit. The first century church, it didn't have a long history of being Pentecostal. It didn't have a long heritage, but what it did have was an experience. How many of you know that what we need in the 21st century is not just a heritage, although we're thankful for the heritage that we have, but that we need in our day and hour an experience with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit just like they had in the first century church. And the biggest question facing the modern Pentecostal church is this. Will it remain 
Pentecostal. That is the central question that our generation of Pentecostals must answer this question is, are we going to remain Pentecostal? Now, I'm not talking about will we still have Pentecostal in our name on the sign outside the front of the church. I'm not talking about whether or not we'll still identify with saying I am a a Pentecostal. I'm not saying that. I'm saying will we remain Pentecostal in our experience? Will that be who we are? Not a, not a heritage, not something that we leaned upon in our past, but will we as this generation remain a Pentecostal people? How many of you know that that's the heart cry of this conference? The heart cry of why you're here is because we want to continue to be Pentecostal, not just in name only, but in experience. And while the modern Pentecostal has well-crafted doctrinal statements that tell them they are Pentecostal, many have lost the biblical experience of Pentecost. It doesn't really matter what our doctrinal statements may be if we've lost the experience of Pentecost. We may claim one thing, but I want more than just a doctrinal statement. I want an experience that says that it's fresh and anew for this generation that we're living in, that we are Pentecostal by experience experience. And here's the danger. What one generation believes but doesn't practice, the next generation will neither believe nor practice. And the danger can be in this day and hour is that we say we believe in Pentecost. We believe in the experience. We believe in it, but we don't actually practice it. And what will happen in the next generation is they will neither believe it nor practice it. But as a generation, that we would say, God, I don't just want to believe it, but I want an experience with it so that it can pass on to the next generation that they won't just hear stories of what used to be they won't just hear stories about how God used to move but they'll say I remember when God ministered and moved in the empowerment experience I remember when God came down and helped my life and the next generation of Pentecostals is in the balance right now it's in the balance right now Because the modern Pentecostal church has created a culture in which we claim an identity of being Pentecostal, but we're afraid of letting the Spirit have His way. We're afraid uh, of what somebody might think if if we have a shout down service. We're afraid of what somebody might happen if somebody gets baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And and that's where the modern Pentecostal church is. But we are not that, right? We're not that. But there is a danger of that creeping into our hearts and our lives and our church. And whenever there is a disconnect between beliefs and behaviors, we have one of two options. We can change our behaviors to line back up with our beliefs. If there's a disconnect between belief and behavior, one of the options we have is we can change our behaviors to match back up to what we believe. That's an option. That's what we can do. Or the other thing that we can do is we can change our beliefs to match our new behavior. And that's where a lot of the modern church is, is they have changed their beliefs to match their new behavior. But the word of God hasn't changed. How many of you know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? And the same spirit that fell at Pentecost is able to move in our hearts and our lives today. And so if there's a disconnect between belief and behavior, God, I want my my behavior to change back up to what God would have it to be. I want the behavior to line back up to what God would have it to be. And it's self-evident that the Pentecostal church is at a critical crossroads in our generation. And what is done in our generation will impact countless future generations. What's done in this moment right now in our generation is going to have a ripple effect throughout the 21st century. And as I'm going to preach here in a moment, and into the 22nd century. What what is happening right now is a pivot point of what is going to take place in the future. Now the year 2100, the 22nd century is a date that no minister in this house tonight is going to see. None of us this morning are going to see the year 2100, barring some divine miracle, right? None of us are going to see the 22nd century. Even my sons may not see it. So 
we are planting right now, though, spirit-empowered seeds that the 22nd century generation of Pentecostals will reap. We are planting spirit-empowered seeds even this very week, even this very moment. We are planting seeds right now that a generation that we will never see, a generation that, that we will never physically witness is going to reap the, the, the harvest of what we are planting right now. Therefore, it's vital that we recognize the importance of continuing to sow and water in our generation by the power of the Spirit. It's vital that you and I recognize that what we're doing right now, it's not just for right now, but it's for a future time that we will never see, that we'll never recognize. But there's a generation ahead that's going to reap the benefits of a Spirit-empowered 21st century church that is living as God would have to live now now some might object to thinking about the 22nd century Pentecostal by stating why should we worry about the Penteco- what Pentecostalism looks like in the year 2100 after all Jesus will come before then and some might object to say well why even worry about the 22nd century Pentecostal why preach about it why even think about that because Jesus is coming back before the year 2100 now, now I, I, I think it's important that we do think about it. And here's three reasons why. One, one, Jesus told us to occupy until he comes. And the truth of the matter is, right, we don't know when he will come. He might come before the year 2100, but it, he also could not come before the year 2100. And our task as men and women of God is to occupy until he comes to, to allow the Spirit of God to work in our lives as though, yes, He could come today. We believe in the imminent return of Jesus. Yes, He could come today, but it could be the year 2100 before He comes. And if that's the case, I want to do everything in my power to live not just for today, but to live for a future generation that God could work in. Because His return is unknown. It's good stewardship to both anticipate our blessed hope and to prepare as though his coming won't be in our generation. It's good stewardship to look for that blessed hope of his, his glorious appearing. How many are looking for him to return? Looking for his, yeah, we're looking for that. That's our hope. That's our prayer. We say, even so, Lord, come quickly. That's our desire. And so we look for that and we pray for that. But also we prepare and, and we, we vision, we look for as though he wasn't going to come in our generation. If Jesus delays his coming, the next generation of Pentecostals depend upon us right now. So, quickly, this morning, a couple things I want us to notice. The 22nd century Pentecostal needs us to keep proclaiming the promise. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Just as the first century received the promise of the Spirit, so the modern Pentecostal must keep proclaiming that the promise of the Spirit is for today. That, that, that what God did and the outpouring of the Spirit, that, that the gifts of the Spirit are just as much for today as they were when they first arrived on the day of Pentecost. Times have changed, cultures have changed, fashions have changed, but the need for the Pentecostal message of Spirit-empowered life is still relevant in this day and hour that we're living in. I know some may say it's old-fashioned and old fogey, and that's okay if they want to say that. I'll go back to the first century. I'll go back to what God God had at the day of Pentecost that's okay times may change cultures may change but God wants to minister and move as relevant as he did in the first century in our century now there is a push in the modern Pentecostal church to make spirit baptism an optional accessory instead of a normative necessary this is necessary there is a push in modern Pentecostalism to make spirit baptism with the evidence of speaking in other tongues To make it an optional accessory. Something that you can just add on to your life. And it's good if you've got it. But it's okay if you don't. 
Now, how many know that is a lie from the pits of hell? And that's a, that is a design of the enemy to weaken the Pentecostal church. And not just the Pentecostal church, but the spirit of God that wants to minister and move in this day and hour. Because the enemy knows, he knows that if there's a spirit-filled church, if there's a spirit-filled body of believers that are working and moving, that hell has no power against it, that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And so he has tried to convince the modern Pentecostal Pentecostal, the spirit baptism, it's just something that you might have, but maybe not as well. But it's not just an accessory to add to your life. How many of you know that it's a necessity that we in this day and hour remain baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? And we must not make the devastating mistake of presenting spirit baptism as an optional accessory to the Christian life. Pastor, preacher, spirit baptism, we, we believe it as a doctrinal statement, yes. But it, it, it's, it's not just a doctrinal statement that we believe. It's got to be something that we're living in in this generation. It's got to be something that's operating in our hearts and our life. It is a necessity in the day and hour that we're living in. However, both the present and the future Pentecostal church be- desperately need you and I To continue proclaiming the Spirit's promise. This generation, this 21st century church, it needs us to keep proclaiming that the promise is unto you. And it's unto your children. And they need that to take place. And just as we are indebted to the generations before us who contended contended for the moving of the Spirit in their day. So the next generation of Pentecostals are looking to us to contend For Pentecost. Just as each and every one of us look back at people who who blaze the trail for us. Who who we stand upon their shoulders and we, we look to them as heroes in the faith. And just as we look back to them and are thankful for what God did in their generation. And how because of what they did, God has blessed our life. So there's a future generations of Pentecostals that we have not met that don't even exist yet. But they, they are crying out. Out from the womb as it were saying keep remain Pentecostal remain spirit baptized remain holding on to the truth of the word of God both the present and the future Pentecostal church desperately need you and I to continue to set an example of spirit filled living The Holy Spirit alone empowers our message so that it's not simply pervasive words of human wisdom, but rather it's the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. How many of you would say, I don't want to just get up in my pulpit and just say words that come from human minds, but God, I want a demonstration of the power of the Spirit. God, what we need in this day and hour is not more intellect from from man, but God, we need an outpouring of the spirit that will change hearts and lives that will break the yoke that will do what only God can do so they need us to keep proclaiming the promise and they need us to keep separating ourselves and with many other words he did testify and exhort saying save yourself from this untoward generation Now the word untoward simply means perverse or wicked. Save yourself from this wicked, perverse generation. As 21st century Pentecostals, we live in a society that is completely controlled by ungodly and perverse ideologies and agendas. How many of you know we're living in wicked days? We are living in dark and evil and perverse days. How many of you ever thought you would have seen this take place? In your lifetime, how many of you ever thought that this would take place? That from the very seat of power in our nation, that the abomination, yes, I said abomination, that is homosexuality, would be trumpeted and promoted and would be proclaimed as a virtue. That pride would become a virtue. 
We are living in a society in which that agenda has not just gone to the White House, but it's infiltrated every single house through entertainment and through media. And so we as the people of God have to guard against this perverse generation and say, yeah, it may be in the White House, but it's not in my house. I said, yeah, it may be in the White House, but it's not in my house. That as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise right now. Yes, out there. I see what's going on out there, but we're not of them that draw back unto perdition. Or Uvalde, or countless other school shootings. It used to be school was a safe place to be, a place where you could go. And enjoy childhood of growing up, being with friends. No, school's, the school is a war zone now. The school is a, is a war zone now. And, and, and we take God out of society. We take God out of school. And we wonder why our children are in the shape that they're in. Or, or, you know, Roe versus Wade being overturned. I mean, not long ago that took place, and, and man, people came out of the word woodwork. All these different people come out and saying these, idol- these ideas and philosophies that to, 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 to save an unborn baby is a wicked thing. That to save a child is an evil thing. How many of you know that God is the creator of life, has a purpose for every life? The born and those that have not been born yet. But the evil and the hatred for the sacred has been just pervasive in our society. And you know that. The total depravity of our generation should not come as a surprise to us. For Paul warned of the increase of wickedness. This know also that in the last days perilous or literally dangerous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. What does he say? Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. What does he say at the end of that? He says, from such turn away. From such don't associate yourself. Don't be like them. Don't don't associate yourself with those that do that. But he said it's going to get worse and worse. However, if we think wickedness is bad in our generation, what kind of evil will the 22nd century Pentecostal face? You think wickedness is bad in our day. What will the next generation face? Those have been in ministry for a long time. We ask you, would you ever think there'd be a day where they would ordain homosexuals? You say, no, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. Oh, yeah, it has. It is. It's happening right now. In mainstream denominations, it's happening right now. And, and, and one generation slide that far, what will the next generation be? How evil will the 22nd century be that that generation of Pentecostals will have to face, will have to deal with an unprecedented amount of evil? The generation before us could not imagine the wickedness that we must contend with today. The generation before us, if they were to, travel through time somehow and look at our society today, they would be utterly shocked at where we're at today. They they could not have imagined that we could get this far in wickedness and evil. They couldn't comprehend that it could get that bad in in a godless society. And I want to present to you this morning that we cannot really comprehend how bad it could be and that for the 22nd century Pentecostal, how wicked that society will be and what will they need in that day and hour. They will need to look back to a generation that had a wicked society but continued to serve God and stood up and said, no, we're not going with the agenda of this world. No, we're not living like that, but we're going to be a holy people under God. Likewise, we cannot conceive the evil that the next generation of Pentecostals will face. 
But the answer is the same in every generation. The people of God must continue to live holy lives. The answer is actually the same. Whether it's the 1st century, the 2nd, the 3rd, the 14th, the 15th, the 21st, the 22nd, or whatever generation. No matter how wicked it may get, the answer is actually the same every time. That you are to be a holy people, a peculiar nation. That you are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. The answer is the same. It doesn't change. And just like we benefit from the generations before us. It stood for living a separated life unto God. So the 22nd century Pentecostal needs an example of holy living that they can look to. God, let us continue to live separate from this world with a spirit-empowered witness that will impact our generation. Yes, it will impact our generation. But it, it will impact a generation that is to come that will look back and say, I can keep standing in my generation because there was a generation before me that remained faithful in the spite of the wickedness around them. Each of us can point to men and women of God in the 20th century whose spirit-empowered life still impacts your ministry today. Now, real quickly, I want to walk through a couple things here that I think will be helpful to us. I want to introduce you to a couple people that you might not know. First person I want to introduce you to is Sister Reverend Laura Shank. Now, in 1926, Sister Laura Shank started a Sunday school on her porch that eventually became Union Pentecostal Church. A small little gathering of a Sunday school designed for children, neighborhood children came to her front porch, and she began to teach them the Word of God. Seemingly an insignificant act. Most people might look at what she did In 1926, a little Sunday school class for a few small children in the neighborhood. And look at that and think, oh, that's cute. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice little thing you're doing there, sister. That's good. Good job. But put their, look down their nose and think that's not very much at all. But but God is a God that can take the little and turn it into much. How many of you know that old song, Little is Much When God is in it? You remember that song? Little is much when God is in it. But she was faithful in her generation to do what God had called her to do, what the Spirit of God had been pressed upon her to do. Nobody else may have thought it was important. Nobody else may have applauded her and said, good job, way to start this. And nobody else may have cared. But she was obedient to God in her generation. And because of that, a church was birthed that eventually became Union Road Pentecostal Church. A church that a young boy went to with a call of God on his life. Came from some dysfunction in his family, but God had called him to preach. And because there was a faithful pastor, Pastor Hurst, who was there continuing what God had started a long time ago. There was a young boy that went there and was trained for ministry at a young age and was developed for what God would have him to do. And you're looking at that that young man because, because somebody started a vision. Somebody started something a long time ago. I reaped the benefits. Sister Laura Shank never envisioned me. When she started that Sunday school, she never thought of how it would impact a young boy. And she never even dreamed of it. But because she was faithful in her generation to do what God had called her to do, it had generational impact. Some of you, the enemy lying to you and telling you what you're doing is not mattering. It's not making a difference. It, it, it's not. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Laura Shank. I want to introduce you to another person. Some of you may be familiar with him. D.C. Branham. D.C. Branham died the year I was born. But he started in 1969 a place where God could help himself to young lives. Called Ozark Bible Institute. And as a young man with a call of God in my life, 
I felt God impress me through Pastor Hurst and him having gone there and his witness in my life to go to Ozark Bible Institute. Now, Brother Branham created something that, in, I mean, a small Bible college. The, the, the beginning may, may not look like much, but, but what he did in his generation impacted somebody that he never could have dreamed that he would ever impact. And one day, <laughs> one day, I'm going to walk the streets of gold with Brother D.C. Branham and tell him, Brother, I never got to meet you on earth. I, I never got to know you, but I got to know your heart. I got to know your vision. I got to know what God, because what you did in your generation impacted my generation and impacted my life. And I am who I am. And I made it to heaven because of what you've done in your generation. Let me introduce you to Reverend Herbert, Herbert Johnson. He started preaching to cotton farmers in Denton, Texas. And in 1949 founded Faith Tabernacle. Most of you here have never heard that name. Unless you go to church here, you have, but most of our, all of our visitors, you probably have never heard that name. You never heard of Herbert Johnson. You don't know anything about his life or his ministry. But what Herbert Johnson did by planting a church called Faith Tabernacle many, many years ago is actually at this very moment impacting your life and your ministry. What he did long time ago, what he did is right now ministering to you because faith tabernacle doesn't exist. If there's not somebody that has a burden for some cotton farmers, some people that others would reject, some others that people would forget or neglect or wouldn't care about. But there was a man of God who had a burden from the spirit of God that said, God, I want to serve my generation. I want to do all that you would have me to do. And because he was faithful in what God had called him to do many years ago, you you, you, you are reaping the benefits of it. You're reaping the benefits of a ministry that has long since passed gone, but because he was faithful. And although I never met any of these ministers, I never met Sister Laura Shank, I never met Brother Branham, I never met Brother Herbert Johnson, each of them have impacted my life in transformational ways. And they continue to make an impact into the 21st century. None of these ministers could have known their impact on my life. None of them could have known that they would impact me. But God knew. I said God knew. None of them could have conceived of the fact that what they did in their day would reach far past their day and reach down and minister in my heart, in my life. And what I want us to understand is it is impossible for the minister of God to judge their ministry accurately. I'm going to say that again. You need to get this in the depths of your soul. It is impossible for you to accurately judge your ministry. It is impossible. So stop doing it. That was a better statement than you responded. I said stop doing it. Stop judging your ministry compared to some other preacher, compared to some other missionary, compared to some other church, to some other path. Stop doing it. Because every time you do it, you're wrong. Because you can't accurately know it. And the enemy loves to play those games in our minds to get us to think, well, I'm not like so-and-so, and I can't do this, and I, and I can't do that. And compared to them, I'm not, my, my, my ministry is not. Stop judging your ministry. Let eternity judge your ministry. I said let eternity judge your ministry. Because only eternity will reveal our effectiveness. And our task is simply to do two things. To continue to live out our spirit-inspired mission in our generation faithfully. Your and mine only job 
is to serve our generation faithfully. Isn't that what, what he said? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That is all that we're called to do is simply be faithful with God, what God has called us to be and to do. And then to be an example to the next generation to, to help them fulfill their, their spirit-inspired mission. So be faithful in your generation and help empower the next generation to be all that God would have them to be and to do. Because the truth of the matter is that we were handed this baton from somebody a, a long time ago. And we're going to eventually hand it off to somebody else. Because it's not about us, but it's about the kingdom of God. I said it's about the kingdom of God. So be faithful while you're running your race. And be ready always to pass it to a next generation. I want to talk to you about Reverend Lonnie Adams, who faithfully pastored Sherman First Assembly. And because of what he did in his generation, in the 22nd century, there was a Pentecostal spirit empowered church in Sherman, Texas, where a young kid walks in on a Sunday morning who doesn't know Lonnie Adams' name, doesn't know the history of the church. But he walks in and feels the presence and the power of God and falls into an altar and gets saved and called into the ministry. But, but God, by his grace and his mercy, because there was a spirit-empowered person who was working under the anointing of God in Sherman, Texas, that there is a spirit-empowered church in Sherman, Texas in the 22nd century. I'll tell you about Randy Perry. Reverend Perry pastoring Broken Arrow, and because of his faithfulness to God, in the 22nd century, there's going to be a mother that comes into that church, is on drugs, and struggling, doesn't know what to do, about to lose her kids, but by the grace of God, there's a church there that is spirit empowered and she gets saved and she gets right with God. She gets her children back and it changes the course of their destiny, of their family because somebody in their generation was faithful and because they were faithful, it led to another generation. I want to tell you about Reverend Jared Davis who pastored Lighthouse Ministries and he provided a Pentecostal church in Seneca, Missouri with a spirit-filled Pentecostal church that, that, that long past he's gone there's somebody there that is reaching out in Seneca and ministering and moving to the hurting in Seneca tell you about Mark Thomas in Cedar Rapids, Iowa a spirit empowered church that some family walks in on the verge of divorce in the year 2100 but because somebody was faithful in their generation to do what God had called them to do there's going to be an opportunity for them to come into their house of God and get the marriage counseling that they need to get the help that they need in their life because somebody was faithful in their generation brother Thomas it's not just about the here and the now but there's a young person in 2100 that's going to be impacted by your ministry let me tell you about brother Joey Sweeney International House of Prayer, Oakdale, Louisiana. Because of his faithfulness, there's going to be somebody that walks into, into IHOP. <laughs> and it's not the pancake place. But walks into IHOP. And in fact, in 2100, they're not walking in where you're at right now. They're walking into a brand new building that's not even built yet. It's not even there yet. But, th but they're, they're walking into a place that isn't even existence yet. But they're walking in there. And God, by His mercy and His grace, is going to have a, a, a powerful witness of the spirit, coastal spirit in Oakdale, Louisiana. Because of what God is doing right now. I'm here to tell you that there's going to be a church in Ohio, in Lorraine, Ohio, Broadway Assembly. That God is going to raise up a generation in the year 2100 because somebody was faithful to what God would have them. there's going to be somebody in Stuttgart, Arkansas that's going to come off the street and get saved by the power of God because somebody was faithful in their generation oh come on somebody give God a hand clap of praise somebody give God a hand clap of praise for what he's going to do for what he's going to do 
for what he's going to do. For what he's going to do. What he's done, we thank you, God, for what you've done. Come on, say it right now. Come on, thank you for what you've done. Oh, thank you. We thank you for what you're doing. Give us something to give you praise for what he's going to do. right now by your faithfulness. I wish I had time this morning to go by and tell each and every one of you what God has done and what He's doing and what He's going to do in the future. You may be seated. I'm just about done. I wish I had the time this morning to personally tell each and every one of you what I just did. That your faithful ministry today will inspire a generation of Pentecostal ministers that you will never meet. That you'll never know. And frankly, frankly, may never know you. But it's not about that, is it? It don't matter if they know my name. It don't matter who gets the credit. All that matters is that the kingdom of God is advanced. It don't matter if they know my name or, or anybody recognizes that at all. But all that matters is that there's a next generation of Pentecostals that are continuing to live out a spirit-empowered witness in their generation. God birthed. Come on, church, pray. Come on, right now, lift your hand to your heart. Hey, God, right now, he's trying to speak to us. Oh, God's trying to speak to you right now. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to you right now. Pastor, let God speak to you right now. Every week you speak to somebody. Let God speak to your heart right now. <laughs> God birthed within our hearts a spirit like David that will consider how they impact the next generation. You remember David? He couldn't build the temple, but he set up stuff for the next generation. He didn't pout or, or worry, say, God, I can't do everything that I'd like to do in my generation. But he set up the next generation to do more than what he could do. God, if your vision can be completed in your generation, your vision is too small. I said, if your vision can be completed, and your generation, your vision is too small. God, give us a generational size vision that will go beyond my ministry, that will go beyond your ministry, that will go beyond your local church, that will go and reach to where God would have it to be. And right now, right now, in the year 2022, right now, you and I are planting spirit-empowered seeds that the 22nd century Pentecostal is going to reap. And so our task in this generation is to be faithful to what God has called us to be. And to go and do and to help the next generation to be all that God would have us to be. Paul said, I've planted, Paul has watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything. Turn and tell somebody, I ain't anything. Oh, some of you didn't do that. Turn and tell them, I ain't anything. 
Yeah, so, so Paul, it, it, he that planteth, neither he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. It ain't about me, and it ain't about you, and it ain't our, about our ministry. But we're faithful in our generation to plant and to water and to be faithful to what God would have. And God is going to have an increase of every tongue and tribe and people from every nation, from every people group. is going to be standing around the throne, worshiping God. And together, we're going to say, God, you brought in a harvest so if the enemy can discourage the sower in one generation he will have destroyed the harvest in the next if the enemy can discourage you in your generation to stop sowing spirit empowered seed he hasn't just hurt this generation but he's damaged the next generation and what they can reap and what God would do in their life and so the 22nd century Pentecostal needs you and I to keep sowing spirit empowered seeds to keep proclaiming the promise of the spirit and keep separating ourselves from this perverse generation how many of you say I want to be what God would have me to be to impact this generation and the generation to come would you stand right now I'm done we're, we're moving Moving on, stand right now and say, God, I want to be what you'd have me to be, God. Lord, I rebuke every lie of the enemy. I rebuke every lie of the adversary that will want to stop me from sowing in my generation, from continuing to water in my generation. But God, I'm going to be all that you've called me to be. Not just for my time, but for the future generation. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise if he's spoken to you tonight, this morning. Oh, God, thank you for speaking to us. Oh, thank you for helping us this morning. Hallelujah. 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 There's a presence of the Lord here right now. We're making a shift right now, but right where you're at, one more time, just lift your hands, lift your heart. Say, God, continue to speak into my heart. I drove a long way, so I flew a long ways to get here, God. Lord, speak to my heart right now. Minister and move in my heart and in my life. Oh, yes, God.